The Labour Party soon had a chance to put their ideas into practice. In December 1923, there was a general election. Although the Conservatives won most seats, they were in a minority. Labour and the Liberals massively outnumbered them. As the second largest party, Labour got the chance to govern. This first Labour government, led by Ramsay MacDonald, only lasted from January to November, before being replaced by the Tories again. They claimed that they were in office but not in power, and so couldn't really be blamed for not having done much. A good sign of just how much they intended to do, though, and how clear their attachment to socialist principles was, can be seen from the following. J. H. Thomas, union leader and MP, was appointed to the colonial office. He introduced himself to his departmental heads with this statement, I'm here to see there is no mucking about with the British Empire. In February 1924, the dockers called a strike. This was opposed by the Labour government. In March, the tramway workers in London came out on strike. The railway unions proposed to come out in sympathy. MacDonald's response was to use the full force of the law on the side of the bosses. He invoked the 1920 Emergency Powers Act. This would have meant the declaration of a state of emergency if the strike had not been called off. In August, the Attorney General tried to prosecute J.R. Campbell, the editor of the Workers Weekly, on a charge of incitement to mutiny. These actions all helped set the tone for the future. Other notable Labour victories of this government were to go ahead with rearmament, including the building of five new cru cruisers, the bombing of indigenous people in Iraq and shooting strikers in India, presumably for mucking about with the British Empire. Just six years after adopting its so-called socialist constitution, Labour had had a chance at government. It had acted like any other capitalist party, for the bosses and against the workers. Labour got elected again in 1929. Again it was a minority government. It promised to reduce unemployment which stood at 1,164,000. Within a year it had gone up to, by 750,000 to 1,911,000. In two years it had more than doubled, reaching the then record level of 2,707,000. Faced with the drain of gold from London in 1931, the government discussed ways to save the pound. What this meant was cuts in civil service pay and unemployment benefits. Cabinet split over this and MacDonald, the ILP member, formed a coalition with Liberals and Tories to force the measures through. The majority of the party went into opposition. In the two years Labour had been in power, four million workers had had their wages reduced, including the government's own employees. What followed was a period in the wilderness with continued Tory government. The party came under the leadership and control of two men, Clement Attlee and Sir Stafford Cripps. Both were members of the ruling class. Attlee was the son of a solicitor who had gone to public school. During the First World War, this famous socialist and ILP member had been a major in the army. He had tried to enlist just two days after the war started, but had been refused because he was too old. Undaunted, undaunted he kept on trying and had, on a number of occasions, considered shooting men for cowardice. War, when war broke out in 1939, Labour were quick to support the British ruling class. In fact, Attlee's biggest concern in the early days of September was that Chamberlain, the Tory Prime Minister, wouldn't declare war on Germany. In 1940, Attlee got his reward. Labour entered into coalition with the Tories and Attlee and Greenwood got into the war cabinet. Attlee's first job was to introduce an emergency powers bill, which gave the government the power to control every aspect of life. He went on the BBC to announce that, quote, Parliament has given to the government full power to control all persons and property. The direction of persons to perform services will be under the Minister of Labour, Mr Ernest Bevin, end quote. Like the First World War, the second brought increased prices and lowered standards of living to workers. Like the First World War, workers didn't just accept this. There were strikes in many industries, most notably in the mines. As Labour and the TUC were partners in the capitalist war effort, their response was simple, 
Strikers were saboteurs and enemies. They must return to work. Everything was to be subordinate to the war effort. Workers must wait till the war was over.